of those who are joining us for the first time. My name is Dawar Hashmi, uh, and I chair this diversity in local government leadership network. Welcome to our forum event. Uh, just to add to a little bit what Maddy just said uh, and run through a little bit of housekeeping first, uh, can I request that you all please check your microphones now and make sure that they're set to mute. Uh, if you are invited to address the panel, then you can unmute at that time. Uh, but at all other times, please can you ensure that there is no audio interference. Um, feel free to leave your cameras on. It is great to see you all. If at any stage you do have issues with connectivity, then try switching your cameras off. That may help. Um, please. Uh -huh. use... Yep. Is someone about to speak? OK. Um, please use the chat function for comments or questions. Uh, you can also get involved in the debate on social media. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtag DLGL forum. Now, this is a discussion. It is not a set of speeches. Uh, and the whole purpose of these forums is so that we can air our views and opinions openly. Uh, we want you to get involved. If you'd like to say something, uh, please raise your virtual hand and I will bring you into the conversation at a suitable moment. Uh, just so that you all know, this session is being recorded. Uh, it will be shared with you all to view later. Uh, we've also got my editorial, editorial for the municipal the journal with us today. He'll be covering the forum and writing a piece so that you can read all about it. I want to start by setting the record straight. So last year I wrote and published an article uh, with the heading that if you're worried about a lack of diversity in your workplace, then white men are the solution. I highlighted all the white men who'd taken a chance on me throughout my career. Uh, and I did mention in that article that I'd need a lot more time to speak about the women who've had an influence and impact uh, on my journey to now. Uh, I grew up in a matriarchal home with my mother and me being the only brother to four sisters. I've been fortunate enough to always be surrounded by strong women. Uh, I'm sure Stuart and Tom will agree that it's no accident that we've got three formidable women on the panel today. More on them later. Um, Ethnocultural diversity is front of mind at the moment. Uh, the events of the last few days have shown us that there's still so much more that we need to do. But let's not forget the achievements that we've made on gender. You know, we've more women in leadership roles now, and they seem to be doing better than the men. Uh, you only need to look at the response to the global pandemic and see the ways that countries like Germany, New Zealand, uh, Taiwan and Finland have been cited as exemplars. Maybe the fact that they're all run by women has something to do with it. So as we celebrate women in leadership today, I want to start with a thank you and also an introduction. Thank you, first of all, to one incredible and wonderful woman. Now, not many of you will know this, but when I was a junior recruiter back in 2007, I'd spend most of my days trying to canvas local authority directors and not getting very far because you have the fiercest PAs. And one day I called a corporate director at Hampshire County Council and I was gobsmacked when it wasn't the PA, but she herself who answered the phone. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, so I just blurted out the first thing that came to my mind, which was, hi, I really want to recruit senior people in local government, but I've not really done much of it before. Can you help me? Uh, there was a little pause, followed by a gentle laugh. And after that initial con unforgettable conversation, uh, she invited me to meet her. And then she became my mentor. And I remember going to my very first National Children and Adult Services Conference back in 2009 with her, where she demonstrated the power of networking to me. You know, everyone from the Director General to DASs and DCSs up and down the country knew her. She got me to contact the Shadow Health Secretary before the coalition government was formed, and he agreed to join me for a meeting with several local authority directors of adult social care. When Paul Snell and I uh, rolled out a development program for aspiring directors in social care in 2011, even before the National Skills Academy for Social Care was set up, that was her idea. I, I can see you on my screen, and I know you're not going to like me doing this, but Rhea Mattox, thank you for all your guidance, care and advice throughout all of these years. There's so many things in my career that I simply would not have achieved had you not taken a chance on me. And you are the one person who I will always seek validation from. 
And for those of you who haven't yet had the pleasure of meeting or knowing this incredible woman, she's right here amidst us. So please say hi in the chat. You never know. She might change your life the way she's changed mine. Sticking with the theme of formidable women and moving on to introductions. Gosh, this network is really growing at an incredibly rapid rate. I mean, just look at this virtual meeting and you'll see how much talent there is out there. Um, I've mentioned uh, the steering group to you uh, before, but today I'd really like you to meet the amazing group of people who are working tirelessly behind the scenes and helping me to bring these forums and events to you. Benedicta, do you want to introduce yourself and kick things off? Hello, um, and thank you, Dawa, for a great um, introduction and setting the scene. Uh, great to hear about phenomenal women, uh, female leaders. Um, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Benedicta Asamwa Russell. Um, I am a delivery manager in Camden Council, um, have been in local government for the last 10 years. Um, and uh, Dara, Dawa asked me to, uh, to be part of the steering group for the diversity in local government leadership. Um, and of course, I, I jumped at the opportunity. I'm an aspiring leader, um, someone who also actually considers herself a leader despite um, my title, because it's ab about how I work with people, how I support people, coach people. Um, and I, I just love the opportunity to be part of this forum. We've heard from some great people um, over the last few months um, and really looking forward to the to today's session, so um, thank you. Janine. Hi, I'm Janine Whitehorn. Um, I currently work as an interim, working predominantly in local government, um, leading on kind of delivery change and improvement. Um, I spend a lot of my time focusing my work around kind of social value, partnership development, corporate transformation, um, and I generally work usually at around kind of director level with organisations who are willing to seek quite um, radical and ambitious change. Um, I also do a number of kind of charity roles. And one of the key ones that I do as a trustee is at the London Community Foundation, where I'm leading a lot of work around the um, EDI audit of kind of the charity sector and how we make sure that we are supporting grassroots organisations and particularly those who are led by participants and really kind of challenging the perceptions around the kind of charity so white um, perception that exists at the moment. I've only fairly recently joined this um, exec steering group of the DLGL forum um, and I think generally my role in life is to ask challenging and sometimes difficult questions um, and to make sure that actually um, around all the important things that conversations move towards action and I hope that's how I will contribute going forward. Thank you. Lena? Um, hello colleagues, good afternoon. Um, my name is Mina Kishnani. Um, I'm currently the Interim Transformation Director at the at Birmingham City Council. Um, I've um, been in the industry for 35 years um, and uh, I think just say like being part of this network it's really important to me um, to inspire confidence in others um, and you know I think when people see people at the top table who are of colour they feel they have a chance to succeed, and, and I'm I'm really here to inspire others to to, to want to do that, to want to be at those top tables. Um, um, I, I want to be part of the network because I want to inspire confidence in those non-white potential leaders of the future. Um, I want them to help to help to help them to overcome the barriers that they face. Um, and use like my net my networks and Dawa talk, talked about networks. It's such a critical part of succeeding. Um, in this sector. So to help people to kind of use use my influence, use my networks to share with others, to impart on my with my journey of success. Um, and my vision for this network, I think this is a moment. It's a moment um, and, and it's a movement and a movement that if we don't seize the opportunity right now, there isn't another time when we can. And it's great that we're all coming together to do this, um, to be able to challenge the status quo. Let's remember that what gets measured gets done. So let's make sure that we are exposing where these things are not happening across the sector. Um, and I want to use this group and to be part of this group to make sure we can inspire those senior leaders of the future who are non-white. 
and, and, and use any of my experience I can to make that happen. Thank you, Nina. Nadra. Are you there? You're on mute, Nadira. Good afternoon. Schoolgirl error. Um, delighted to be here and joining my esteemed colleagues this afternoon. Um, so my name is Nadra Hussain. I am the Director of Leadership Development and Research at Socketim. Socketim being the Society of Innovation, Technology and Modernization. We are a network of uh, professional digital leaders that are helping to shape and improve uh, public services, public sector, local government primarily through innovation, creativity, use of technologies and data. Uh, my history, I'm a microbiologist by trade, but I've spent the last 25 years in local government before joining Soccer Team as the head of IT at Enfield and prior to that at Tower Hamlets. And I've seen firsthand um, the, the kind of issues and challenges that women in colour specifically have had to face. I hope that through the kind of championing and the, the work that we're doing more recently, that we have changed some of the issues and challenges that have been very prominent in the past, but I still think we've got an awful long way to go. Now, I want to use, as Mina and others have described, our expertise and experience to help deliver that change, help deliver that difference. And in my current role, I am the, cre the cat that's got the cream as I can help people realise their potential through investment in training, learning and development opportunities, through developing those role models, through showcasing the art of the possible and through the relationships that we collectively have built and the ne networks that we're creating. Aside from the day job and aside from being the board member of this group, um, my passion for diversity and inclusion and, and making a difference includes the ability to, to work with Ned as an Ed with Tech Mums Board. I belong to the Shuri Network in, in the health sector, so very much helping create and promote BAME role models within health. I'm also um, on the board, for the advisory board for the Institute of, of Government Public Policy that's just been created by the University of East London and a number of other women um, boards and forums, including the co-chair and co-founder of the Socketing UK, UKA Women in IT Authority, and recently just been appointed to the Solace in Biz Business Board, which once again, the primary focus of which is improving recruitment and retention in public sector. So absolutely delighted to be working with Dava and the rest of the team to really for forge our way forward and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Nadra. Fisher. Hi, good afternoon everyone and I'm also absolutely delighted to be involved in this. So I'm Trisha Pereira, I'm currently um, a director at Skills for Care. Um, until recently I was head of adult social care for a London borough and for those who don't know Skills for Care is a national organisation, a delivery partner of the Department of Health and Social Care um, and other than collecting the adult so social care workforce data set for England, we provide solutions, practical support and steps um, around leadership, equality, diversity and inclusion, recruitment, retention, workforce planning, developing staff across the whole of social care, um, delivering some of the aims and ambitions and advising the government and the department on um, how we think social care should be supported um, to grow and develop and to be recognised. I'm also the co-chair of um, one of the advisory groups to the government COVID-19 task force and um, co-chair of the advisory group for the um, workforce race equality standards. Um, that's the new social care standards which are being tested in 18 local authorities at the moment. Um, so I, a few years ago, I have been involved in developing and hosting and delivering women in leadership um, sessions and opportunities, and that's women in social care leadership and academia. So creating space, um, opening doors, supporting individuals who are aspiring into those roles. And now I'm taking that conversation directly to ministers um, about the lack of visible leadership in um, in social care. So I'm really excited to be part of this. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be to be working with you all. So look, it's been a, a tough 
few days. Uh, I don't need to guess how you might be feeling. Uh, proud, but deflated, disgusted maybe. Yeah. I just want to take two minutes to share something that may make you feel better. Zara, are you here? Yes, yes I am. Zara, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you. Still, I rise by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still, I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head, low down. Shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard, because I laugh <laughs> like I've got gold mines digging in my backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise? Because I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, ladies and gentlemen. I okay, I might be tempting a crash here, but can you please unmute just for a moment and give Sara a round of applause? Cheers. <laughs> so Zara is a 14 year old performance poet and actress. Uh, she attends St. Marlebone School, a performing arts speciality school of excellence in the city of Westminster. Uh, she's passionate about race equality and hopes to have a career in the performing arts. Next year, she's going to be starting her GCSEs, as well as the compulsory subjects that she uh, is going to have to take. She's going to be studying triple science, drama, French, Latin and history. Wow. She is the future as are our children and then their children after that. Now we owe it to Zara to do our best to make our society and culture more tolerant and caring. Zara, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today and to show us how brilliant you are. On behalf of everyone here, we wish you the very best of luck as you continue your journey and learn to grow. Thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, on to our main event now. Uh, I'm gonna take a deep breath and refer to my notes. On the panel today, we have Rachel Shimin, Chief Executive at Buckinghamshire Council. Now, Rachel is the first CEO for the new Unitary Council of Buckinghamshire, a council with a gross budget of over one billion and the second largest non-metropolitan Unitary Council in the country. 
Prior to this, Rachel helped to lead local government reorganisation in County Durham, delivering a unitary council in 2009 with significant financial savings and service improvements. The council then went on to become Council of the Year in 2014. Previous roles include the Corporate Director of Children and Adult Services. She's been the East Regional Chair of the ADAS and ADCS networks. Currently, she is the County Council Network's CEO Lead on Adult Care and Health, a member of the Council of the University of Bedfordshire, a board member of the Association of Local Authority Chief Executives, the Lead Chief Executive for the Southeast Strategic Leaders Group, and a member of a number of national government and advisory boards. Rachel is a qualified executive coach and peer reviewer for the Local Government Association, and she was awarded an OBE in 2014. We also have Daljeet Lali, Chief Executive at Northumberland County Council. Daljeet has worked in a number of local authorities and health trusts and was until recently employed in a formal joint executive uh, NHS role. Uh, in her career, Daljeet has worked in a range of business and hospital care and community-based settings, including the petroleum industry, hospitals, care homes and SMEs. For a number of years, Daljeet has worked in senior management positions in the private sector, the NHS and also local government. More recently, she's held a, uh, she's led, sorry, a number of initiatives, including delivering large scale regeneration programs across Northumberland and reasonable, uh, sorry, regional programs, including the development of the North of Tyne combined authority and borderlands. We also have today with us Joe Heath, partner and head of practice for diversity and inclusion, culture and ethics at Green Park. Joe is an equity law improvement professional and a culture and inclusion auditor working in this field for over 20 years. She has worked with global organizations in the private, public and third sectors, carrying out complex inclusion audits and cultural impact assessments. Her clients have included the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Justice, Guys and St Thomas's Trust, the Home Office, BT, Vodafone, Channel 4, HSBC, Siemens, EDF Energy, the list goes on and on. I mean, if I, I'll run out of time if I go through all of it. Uh, prior to joining Green Park, Joe was an integral part of EY's commercial culture and DNI consultancy team, and she was the architect of the methodology of the national equality standard and audit process. Joe is also the European representative representative for the Global Women Fast Forward Initiative. She also supports domestic violence, hate crime and antisocial behaviour teams in London to engage and develop successful programmes. And she was instrumental in the design of the mayoral gold standard for equality and diversity and the mayor's diversity in procurement standard. We're joined today by Tom Stannard. Chief Executive at Salford City Council. Uh, now Salford's a major driver of the growth of Greater Manchester, a key member of the uh, Greater Manchester Combined Authority, and also a partner in the 8 billion uh, plus GMCA devolution programme. He's a nationally recognised specialist in local government, public service reform, and delivering inclusive economic growth. Tom's professional background is uh, in regeneration economic development and skills. Uh, from 2018 to 21, he was Wakefield Council's Corporate Director of Regeneration and Economic Growth. Uh, he was a key member of the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, uh, which is the UK's biggest economic area outside of London. His previous roles include uh, Director of Economy uh, and Skills at Oldham Council, Deputy Chief Executive of the UK Learning and Work Institute, and senior leadership positions in other councils across the UK, including uh, Blackburn with Darwin, uh, the London Borough of Hounslow, and the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Tom is a chartered surveyor, a member and board director of the UK Institute of Economic Development, and a commissioner on the Living Wage Foundation for the UK. Uh, and for a number of years, he's also been a member, policy lead, and spokesperson for SOLIS, currently on infrastructure and planning. Last but certainly not least, we have Stuart Love, Chief Executive at Westminster City Council, where he has been CEO since 2018. Uh, Stuart's held senior roles at the Isle of Wight Council uh, and then at Southampton City Council. He rejoined Westminster in 2013 as Executive Director for City Management and Communities. As Chief Executive, Stuart's focused on changing the culture 
of the organization uh, with a particular emphasis on diversity and inclusion. And this has transformed Westminster into a people led outward looking organization that thrives on learning and innovation. The culture encourages people to be themselves uh, and is based on a, sh uh, a shared set of values. This has ultimately resulted in record levels of staff engagement and in turn improvements in the services delivered by the council. Uh, during this time, there have also been significant positive changes in the senior leadership of the organisation, both in terms of ethnicity and gender. And the Council's diversity and inclusion strategy includes some pretty bold initiatives that are having an impact. Rachel, Daljeet, Joe, Tom and Stuart, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, our first question is from Bernadette Thompson. Hi, good afternoon with it. Uh, yes, it's still afternoon. Hi, 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 Bernadette. Do you want to introduce yourself and ask your question? Hi, I'm Bernadette Thompson. Um, I'm a Deputy Director in the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, uh, where I lead on inclusion, wellbeing and employee engagement. So really, really timely conversation, um, Dawa. Um, my question is kind of a three in one, um, if I may. Um, so the first bit of the question is, um, what do you define as allyship? Uh, the second bit of that question is, why is it important to you personally? And um, is it even more important in this current climate? Uh, and that's to all of the panel. Okay. Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Joe Heath, why don't you take a crack at that? Super. Um, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, so most of the people that know me and indeed my team are on the call know how very important allyship is to me. Um, having had a bit of an alternative upbringing and uh, career path, it's it's very much been the men um, on my career journey that have supported me and been an ally to me, not the women. Uh, and perhaps I'd, I'd assumed it would be having more support from women. So in terms of what it means to, to me personally, it means I need to align myself with other groups that are different to me uh, in a nutshell. It means that I need to utilise the privileges that I have uh, gained now to develop, support and advocate for others who are different to me. It's for me about increasing the voice uh, and visibility of others. But I would just say one last thing before I kind of wrap that up. I do think it's more important than ever before based on many recent events, but I also think it requires real active involvement and empowerment, not just I just sign things off. And, and allyship, I think, has been quite confused and it needs to take a slightly different focus. Um, leaders need to be visible in that action. And for me, it is about having a platform that I now have to bridge any gap and divides. Uh, so for me, that would be my response to our Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Tom Stannard. Yeah, thanks, Doan. Thanks, Bernadette. I mean, great question. I, I think the simple answer for me is allyship is about um, empathy and humility. Um, and I think that's been something I've benefited from throughout my career journey with all of the wonderful men and women who've supported me, sponsored me over the years. I think it becomes more important to demonstrate that much more visibly when you're in senior leadership roles, particularly as um, CEOs in, in much the same way as Joe has um, described really. For me, that's about um, accessibility. It's about setting the culture that people can kind of speak truth to power. Sounds like a contrived uh, phrase, but I think enabling that and allowing the organisation to breathe in that respect is just so, so important. And I think for me, it's both about um, demonstrating that empathy and humility with people from different lived experiences to yourself. But it's also, I think, importantly about um, humility and being able to learn from those who have different professional backgrounds to yourself throughout your career, all the way through to, I think, the day before I retire, which I know will be when I'm about 350 years old these days. Um, I think I will be learning for the whole of that time. I've made a virtue of lifelong learning and its importance in inclusion generally um, over the years and I think that's crucial. Um, I'm not a children's services director and I'm blessed in Salford to have one of the best um, children's services directors in the country and I'm already learning a lot from her in the last six or seven months. I think the final thing I'd say Doa is it's very important 
um, I think for senior leaders to demonstrate how their personal story is uh, relevant to that. And I'll perhaps say more about that later on in the talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Rachel. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Um, so for me, it's about actively promoting and advancing a culture which focuses on inclusion. I think one of the things that we sometimes forget in these roles, and, and when I was listening to the introductions, I was thinking, oh, how worthy are all of we? Uh, and actually, um, there is a risk, isn't there, that in these jobs, we forget that people do look to us. They look to us a lot. They think about what we do. They think about what we say. Because when you're the chief executive of the organisation, you're trying to set the tone. So, so I think it's really critical that we are actively demonstrating that sense of inclusion, but also a sense of you can do this too. Uh, and that for me links back to general kind of hierarchy and power and control, the positive use of power, the encouragement, the ability to enable and inspire people to succeed in a variety of positions in your organisation, irrespective of their background or their individual characteristics, I think is really critical. Um, I think there's all that, that question about is it even more important given the current climate? So I, this might be a bit controversial now. I think there's a real risk that we only talk about inclusion when there is a something that happens. And I think the risk in that is that we fail to recognise it's an underlying issue for many individuals, communities and groups in our society all the time. Uh, and therefore, of course, it is import important right now. But I also think it's critical that we just don't turn away from issues in connection with inclusion because everything seems a bit quieter on the news. Uh, I think we've got to be really actively thinking about how are we involving, what is the lived experience of this group, this individual, this place, what can we do to encourage, enable, inspire and make sure that we use power very positively for the benefit of all of us. Thanks, Doa. Thank you, Rachel. Diljeet. Yeah, thanks, Doa. Um, I was just thinking there um, when I saw the title of this um, group today about allyship and I was thinking, what might we be asked? But do you know what for me what allyship is? It's Zara who's just spoken. It's the board members who've just given us their backgrounds and their commitment. And for me, you know, it, what is it? It's a combination, isn't it? Or a union to bring people together. Um, for a mutual benefit. So for me, this this um, discussion, you know, contributes significantly to an allyship. But for me, is it about maybe strength in numbers? Thinking back 20, well, probably more than that, <laughs> 20 plus years ago, um, when being in a similar position myself to some of the people on this call, thinking about where I was going and how I might make a difference and where I might go. Um, and, and actually, I'll be frank, feeling lucky now that I wound my way through um, some of the challenges and some of the issues to to be in the privileged position that I feel that I am in. So for me, it's about strength in numbers. It's about safety sometimes in numbers, but also it's about empowerment and drive. And I think. Um, I totally agree, and I'm not going to repeat it with Rachel, about the current climate issue. I think we have to be really careful about it is very easy, isn't it, when football doesn't come home, some of the issues that come from that and the the, the great um, sets of information then that come out. And then, you know, we had a similar circumstance when the... Um, race and a quality report was published and there was a bit of an outcry so for me the most important times the most um detailed allyship is probably when there isn't that fuss being created and there isn't that focus because actually that's the time when everyone should be stepping up to the plate and being an ally thank you thank you Dodgy. Stuart. thanks Dara. Can I, I just want to start by saying that I'm somebody who believes in hope because without hope, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing. Um, and for me this week, hope has been in short supply. Um, I am disgusted, I'm angry, I'm sad, and I'm exhausted. And if I feel like that, you know, I, I had this conversation with our staff this morning, I can only imagine how 
my black and brown colleagues feel and how other people on this on this call feel. But I also want to say, Zora, if you are still there, thank you so much. My hope has come rushing back after uh, listening to you. That was incredible. Uh, and I also have no right to say this, but I'm also um, bursting with pride that you are at school in Westminster. Um, just absolutely brilliant. And I'm just happy I got, I got to uh, hear you and, and meet you this way. Um, so on, on the concept of allyship, uh, I have to say I struggle with the term. I always have because in, depending on how it is portrayed, it can sometimes be portrayed as a choice. And I don't believe it is a choice. I believe it is an absolute responsibility for all of us. You know, we look at what's going on th this week with the racism um, on the back of the, the football issues. You look at things like the gender and ethnicity pay gaps that exist across the country, um, the, the inequalities still in health, in education and in housing. Those inequalities were created by me and people who look like me. So I have a responsibility. There is no choice here as far as I'm concerned when it comes to allyship. I, I agree completely with what Joe said. You know, I am privileged. I am privileged to be a white man. Uh, and I, I think we might come onto that um, a little bit later as well. I am privileged to be a white man, but I am also doubly privileged to be the chief executive of Westminster City Council. And with that privilege comes the responsibility to make the change that we need to see. I am... Um, I, I am, as I see it, part of the problem, and therefore I also absolutely am part of the, the solution. And what we've started discussing in our organization is uh, uh, aligning allyship with anti-racism. So it's not good enough just to say I'm not racist. We have to be anti-racist. And the challenge that comes with that, and it was given to me this morning, actually by somebody who's on the call from, from uh, Westminster City Council is, Stuart, tell me what Westminster City Council is doing that's anti-racist. And I have to say, I, it, it, it was a struggle for me to, to come up with an answer to that. We do a huge amount around equality, inclusion, diversity, but anti-racism is something slightly different. So what, as I've said, what we are doing is, is aligning anti-racism with allyship and that means taking action. That is what allyship means to me. Powerful stuff, Stuart. Thank you. Bernadette, does, uh, wh what would you say? What does it mean to you? Gosh, I, 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 I guess the, a combination of all of this. But for me, I, I think it was Joe uh, that, that mentioned action. Ally is a verb. It is a doing word. You cannot be an ally and be silent. So linking up to what um, Stuart kind of said, you need to act. And what does that mean? It's not just one thing. Um, I, I really do like um, Stuart's overview about being anti-racist. And that's just what it is. And, you know, this week has just been absolutely ridiculous. But in how many organisations, how many people have checked in with their people from a Black, Asian and minority ethnic community to say, I guess this must be uh, pretty traumatic for you. So there's a lot that can be done. For me, it's about being, you know, learning how we made progress. And you touched on this, Dawa, how we made progress with the gender equality um, agenda. We had men in the boardroom, in the places of power where decisions were made, being that ally, acting, saying this is not right. You know, I was speaking to a few colleagues some months ago and they were saying oh do you know do you remember what it was like to be the only man in you know when it was you know only you were the only woman in the room I'm like uh, yeah I still have a slight issue with that I'm the only brown face in the room how many times do we have a, a board go into the room to have a discussion and they look around and say oh gosh we're the only white people in the room so it's about that it's about taking action uh, being anti and using the influence to effect change and it's really learning from the progress we made uh, with gender equality you know uh, in Sam uh, Cook's words uh, uh, for me it's always it's a long time coming but I do hope a change a change will come so they're my reflection thank you Dawa. So true thank you so much Bernadette for joining us today right moving on everyone uh, to the next question Aman are you here? Yes hello. Do you want to introduce yourself and ask your question? Hello, I'm Amin Fekongil, Assistant Director in um, Buckinghamshire Council for Quality Assurance. Um, so my question is very much around being an ethnic and female leader, the additional layer of needing to really think about who I am and what I represent for the organisation's frontline staff and public 
is always far greater than the actual ability to deliver on that role. Um, you throw into the mix of that, you know, what's happening in society and political responses to that. It has a massive personal impact, but the professional impact of experiencing that can really, really weigh heavy. Um, so things like, you know, the Education Committee report that talked about white privilege, the term being divisive and possibly, you know, a breach of equality laws. Um, the report on racism in Britain, which said Britain no longer had a system rigged against minorities. I think it evokes massive amounts of really strong emotional responses from diverse leaders, which make it really, really hard to deliver at a senior level in local government. So my question for the panel is, how do you as leaders of the organisation kind of proactively seek out and navigate the unique needs of your diverse leaders? And how do you encourage and support to meet those? Great question, Raman, thank you. Stuart. Uh, thanks very much, Raman and Dawa. I mean, I, uh, first of all, I, I should say, and I've, and I've said this already, um, I, I believe in white privilege whether it, it you know it's divisive or not the fact is it exists i'm a product of it i wouldn't be in this job if it wasn't if it wasn't for that um in terms of the things that um i think we we have been doing and we need to do more of the, in in our organization this is all about the culture of the organization it's every conversa conversation we have it's every decision we make it's looking at how we invest in people we we often talk about the need to be consistently inconsistent in, in terms of taking into account uh, individual needs. We have taken a, a, a wholly different approach to recruitment to what Westminster did four or five years ago. From the very start of the process all the way through to, to final interview panels, um, we've introduced a positive action approach around having diverse shortlists, but as I said, the, the process starts a, a long way before that. But two things I just wanted to touch on that I think have helped enormously in this area. The first one is reverse mentoring. And, you know, when when I, uh, in my previous role, I purely, um, by luck really, found myself mentoring three young Muslim women. And I always say this, that I learned far more from them than they ever did from me. And they shaped me into the chief executive that I am now, along with a, a number of other people. And we've introduced reverse mentoring into our organization and it, it has made a real, real difference to our senior leaders. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's actually a lot of people talk about the difference it's made to their personal lives, not just their their um, their role at work. Uh, and then the other thing we are we are doing, which again is is something that can be difficult and controversial. We might have just lost Stuart there for a second. Um, Dalji, do you want to do you want to just jump in here while we try and get Stuart back into the conversation? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm probably coming at this from a little bit of a different place, um, understandably, because we're all different and have different experiences. So in terms of that question, I felt the weight of that question on your shoulders, Amun. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm nearing the end of my career now and I've been thinking back, especially over the last, particularly since the um, issues around George Floyd and the terrible issues that happened and then you know black lives matter and 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 all of the other issues that have happened in the last couple of years it's really made me from a personal perspective focus in because i'm sitting here thinking i'm probably one of the lucky ones who you know uh, um you know commenced my career in the 80s um and nearing the end of my career and looking back at um some of the issues particularly around race equality and the generational issues so for example you know the issues my parents went through when they came to England in the 60s and then growing up um you know um through that time and living in the northeast which in some areas isn't the most multicultural place in the country and I now look back a little bit and look at my um two children and their take on life is totally different to and it's almost like a sandwich the the experience that my mum and dad had to the experience i had to the experience they're having and for me the leadership aspect of that is i feel that responsibility so what i would ask is to unburden yourself a bit about that weight and responsibility because it's actually not just your responsibility and sometimes people look at us 
Um, you know, in the last couple of years, yeah, I'm the chief exec. I don't mind people looking at me as the chief exec. Um, I do mind if they're looking at me as a chief executive from a minority ethnic background. <laughs> and, you know, I, I I sometimes worry about that because um, I know some people worry about what they say. Some people are worrying about saying things and getting it wrong. And I do that all the time, too. Um, and it was interesting um, that somebody said that to me this morning and it just reminded me, I, I worry about terminology and how we treat people and how we say things. But looking through my organisation, we um, are one of the least diverse places in the country and we do struggle somewhat in some areas. How, how do we support people? You know, we've done a lot of work around our race equality staff network and um, ensuring that staff feel supported. I'm a member of that network. I clearly don't cheer it, chair it deliberately because I think that's inappropriate given I'm the chief exec and sometimes that thing about how people look at you personally. We've got big responsibilities, but do you know what? I, I'm looking around this event. I'm looking at the people who've spoken up earlier and I, and I know I really know things aren't great, but actually they are somewhat better. And I think the more we talk about things, the more we encourage openness and encourage people to say what they feel and how they want to take things forward, the more we'll take ourselves forward. But I, I don't think this is an issue. And, you know, I'm happy to be told otherwise, but for me, it's not an issue that... Um, you know, just people from minority groups should be pursuing. It should be about all of us. It's about equality. It's about inclusivity. But I'll just finish by saying I do think things are getting better. And I know some people will really disagree with me on that. I know there's still institutional racism right across some organisations. And, and and I sometimes wonder, it's maybe... Um, in terms of the diversity grouping, some of it's much worse and a much diverse workforce than other places where it can be highlighted. But, you know, I'm only going from my experience of the last sort of 35 years. Um, I, I feel positive, but I'm not sitting on my laurels. And I think we've all got a responsibility to educate and include and make sure we make a difference. Thanks. Sorry, I'm on mute. Thank you, Dolce. Have we managed to get Stuart back? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I've seen him rejoin, Darbo. All right, no worries. Um, just continue this conversation. Joe, can I just ask you regarding the uh, Commission on Race and uh, Ethnic Disparities report that Amon mentioned, what are your views on it, uh, as well as what, what comes next? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, Amon, the that particular report and other things, and I, I do agree with you, Daljit, but I, I think we can't underestimate the impact that these reports have on people's behaviours, because we see a headline, we see a one-liner, and that's what people go, go with. Um, and I do think it reinforces some of these behaviours, so I, I totally get that. It's it's a tough one for me. I have, um, I have a biracial family. I probably see firsthand disproportionate outcomes and disparities through all the analysis work that we do. I interview thousands of people every year who are ethnic minority and ethno-cultural and have had disadvantage and lack of progression, all those things. So it's almost conditioned in me that when I read these headlines and I hear that we're supposed to be a model country, I find that really, really hard um, to correlate with what I see in my findings. And initially when the report landed, I had friends, family, colleagues all contacting me and I could feel their disappointment about the report. But it was because we were listening to those headlines. So I took the time to delve into the report. I thought it was really important that, you know, we've got to pay attention to those recommendations. And there were a number of recommendations, despite the headlines, that really made sense. So, I mean, maybe I could just reflect on them very quickly. It did re recommend allyship. It did recommend racial fluency and education. It also mentioned about this acronym BAME. Um, 
which has been a lifelong um, bugbear of mine for many reasons, and I know many of my colleagues and friends will agree, the fact that we've used an acronym to shield a number of challenges, we haven't broke down that analysis, we shield representation and challenge through that. So, you know, having a recommendation that suggests we disaggregate that, it, it is what we've all been saying for a long time, but I thought that was strong. Um, you know, recommendations around pushing reverse mentoring and pushing um, education can, can never be a bad thing. But for me, in terms of what I took from that and what I said to my clients is we are not a model country. Um, and I, I, I don't need any report to tell me that. Yes, we've made progress in a number of areas, but I cannot associate with that comment based on what I see. So for me, it's about how do we keep this focus? I agree it shouldn't be Black History Month, it shouldn't be a murder of a man for us to focus on this. These, these uh, racial inequality issues have been happening for years. So how do we keep this on the on the focus and on the radar? Because uh, we so need to. Uh, and I think recent events have um, reinforced that, I'm afraid. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Dolgeen, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I'm using the old I was named, so I'm coming back in, if that's OK. Sure, I does. think um, so. Um, I might not be hugely popular for this, but I, I totally agree on the issue of institutional racism and the, the lead and the media prompting of that and, and also some big organisations following that through. But I think what, what uh, so the 24 recommendations and the details in that report, there is some really positive um, work uh, information in there that we really ne need to get into. So the bit I'm probably sad about is when I looked at the recommendations and thought, yeah, we, you know, some of the things around the CQC, inequalities in health, you know, very, areas very close to, to my heart, um, as well as, you know, the pay gap around ethnicity. And, and, and you could go on and on. That's just the, you know, the first few. So for me, I, I, I am not in any way, because I absolutely agree that the issue about institutional racism and the worries about that is very clear. So I think that was ill judged and they probably regret that, I would say, if, if people have got any sense, they would. But for me, I think sometimes, you know, it's easy for mistakes to be made or things happen through the media where a certain things gets covered and then people don't look at it and think I need to look at this and, and, and take forward the stuff that is really important that we need to. And it's also, isn't it? Let's be frank. I'm very apolitical. I work in a political organisation. I'm probably one of the most apolitical people I know. So it's probably more, it's easy for me from a political perspective because I have no political alignment. So I just think um, some of that noise around politics and headline and media sometimes take away some of the real issues that we need to crack. We've all got a responsibility for that. And, you know, our voice needs to be heard and how we do that. We, we you know, this this isn't something about campaigning. It's about we've got some of the um, strongest chief execs um, in the country, whether we're in local government or in NHS roles or in government. And there needs to be some drive really to put, you know, let's have a bit less wor wording and let's have a bit more action. That's all I'm going to say on that. Thank you. Now, just, can I just come in on that? Because I just want to make make really clear, you know, what I said. I do completely agree that the recommendations were powerful. Um, and, and if people went into the detail, they would have, you know, been able to see that. I think press put a particular spin on it and we need to be mindful. But my point is many of us perhaps on this call would have opened that and delved in. Many, many people would never look at that report. They'd only see the headline and that headline set the tone for behaviours in the workplace. And I experienced the backlash of that through our clients. So unfortunately, experts like us, those that are generally interested, go into that detail. But top one liners are all that many of our employees will read. And that tone was was wrong, in my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Alan, what, what would you like to say to that? Uh, I was just going to say, I, I don't disagree in terms of the recommendations. I think it's the the professional and the personal impact of uh, a cumulative effect of what is going on and how then as a, you know, I, I, I'll be really honest, I've questioned my, you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate that I work in a great organisation and, and have had 
loads of opportunities which I never even thought I'd be in but I think the the impact of then questioning whether you know do I want to work for local government generally always comes up in terms of how I might feel but I go back to my actually what I want to do is really influence change and I want to be the person that you know kids like me from Feltham look at and go that's the person I want to be you know not a great academic but found a skill set and worked really hard at it so it's that kind of stuff that for me really important but I think the management of those messages and how that disseminates down when the media do get hold of something is absolutely um, crucial in terms of employees feeling a certain way and then being able to deliver and be the face of it I, I think that's for me the really important part. Thank you. Tom, what would you say to Amon? Yeah, thanks, Dar. Well, um, I'm pleased to hear Amon is a successful person from Felton, to be honest, having worked for a number of years in uh, Hounslow and, and actually back in the day done a whole host of programmes that were trying to help people who were school age in that part of the Heathrow borders. I mean, it's hard graft and, you know, I've every sympathy but every pride in what you've achieved in your career so far I and mean, I can't make a kind of direct link there but I was just pleased to hear the place reference really I think I just two things I wanted to say really um and and I was really sorry Stuart got cut off in mid-flow with some of this because I think his comments about white privilege are powerful they're pertinent you know we've all got an experience and a perspective on that I think he's right that that still exists and we shouldn't pretend that those kind of undercurrents don't exist I, I don't want to disagree entirely with Delgit though, and I, I do like and respect Delgit's um, comments around, um, you know, there has been progress, you know, there is um, a level of optimism, I think, at the moment on this whole agenda. And part of that for me is not saying we're out of the woods by any means, but it's saying there are respected leaders of all colours, of all backgrounds, of all lived experiences who keep trying their best and I'm one of them, everyone on this call I think is in a similar position with this, who propagate, deliberately propagate a positive narrative about this. It's partly about calling out discrimination where and when you see it, and it's also about promoting, I think, a very positive vision of economic inclusion, which is as important as the better representation of race and colour and background in, in all walks of life. And Lots more I could say about that and on that I think is important, but I do share some of Delgit's optimism and I suppose I just wanted to latch onto that particularly to say I think that's important and powerful because it's important that the leaders of significant public organisations who influence a lot of that money and where it goes and the communities it supports subscribe to a positive narrative about continuing to see light at the end of this tunnel. Um, Doha, the only other thing I wanted to say really, I was just struck in the chat by uh, I think it's Amelia's comment about social media on all of this I mean well done Amelia for calling that out I would completely subscribe to that I think what worries me to be honest are is social media is almost just giving another um, voice and root out for discriminatory behavior that has always been there in society I think in some ways some of the trolling I've seen even in the last six, seven months or so since I became a, a, a chief exec of me personally, which has absolutely zero understanding of what we're doing, of my background, of my story and so on, is a, an example of that. And I think in a way, I think it's positive that we see some of that coming through social media because it enables us to call it out. And I completely agree with Amelia that you know, in exactly the same way as it would have been unacceptable for me to say we are not going to clear racist graffiti off the Rashford mural in Manchester. I mean, in point of fact, the community cleared it off before myself or Joanne Roney could get anywhere near the thing, which was positive. It is unacceptable for social media companies to not be substantially more proactive. And it shouldn't just require us as users to report people who do that to us or to our communities or to people that we admire as leaders so um yeah top marks amelia i think that's a really powerful point you made there thanks tom rachel thank you so first of all aman you are an absolutely fantastic leader in our organization and we're really delighted that you've been promoted and you will be doing my job in a number of years time if you want to do it um 
So I, I think that there is a real tendency in organisations, public or private sector, and, and a number of people recognise this, to promote and encourage people who look like us, whoever us are, who talk like us, who went to the same school as us, went to the same university as us, go to waitrose like us. And um, I think we've just got to be very, very aware about the messaging we all give to all our colleagues, whatever our role, about difference and supporting and recognising that difference. So in, in, my, in my role, you know, I, I work in an organisation now that has got a relatively diverse group of elected members, for instance. The former um, council I worked for, also in Buckinghamshire, was less diverse. And it's been fascinating for me to really understand people's personal stories and experiences, because although there might be a perception that people have a very similar background, of course, once you start talking to people and getting to know them, you find actually there are many, many more diverse traits in people's individual backgrounds than you would first imagine. So I do think there's an issue about how we encourage everybody people who are from socio-economically deprived backgrounds, who are of colour, people who've got disabilities, people with learning disabilities. And there was a question in the chat earlier for me, I think, which was something like, how do you make sure issues of equality are stitched through rather than on an agenda? Well, that is a fundamental part of leadership in my view, that you should always go to the, po the question and the point around, what is this going to benefit in terms of communities and individuals? Where are the gaps for us? What are we missing? How can we think differently about what this objective or this strategy or this plan seeks to do so it genuinely makes a difference to people in, ve in very, very many different circumstances? And I think that is our all of our jobs, actually, to do that challenge. And then the final thing that I was just going to reflect on was something Daljeet said earlier about people feeling uncomfortable and uncertain to talk about these issues because they're frightened of saying the wrong thing. They're frightened of using the wrong acronym. It's they want to talk about issues around race and inequality and diversity. And I do think we've got to create the conditions in which that is done in a very supportive environment that looks at making sure that we can be inclusive and doesn't pretend that there aren't issues around diversity and inclusion in all our organisations, because we do want people to talk about it very openly. Um, one of the things we were really pleased to do in our new organisation was to establish um, an equalities network with a particular focus on a range of issues identified by colleagues in the organisation to really talk about stuff, to really think about what we needed to do and change. And, and one of the big learning points for me, and you know, we all learn as we go, it doesn't matter what age or stage we're at, does it? We all learn as we go. Um, I wear, I'm just looking for it, it's not, it's not next to me on the desk. I wear the rainbow lanyard, I wear it all the time. I don't just wear it in private, I wear it all the time. Uh, and I'm really, really proud to wear it. And um, I started wearing it about a year ago and the number of staff who emailed me and said, we're really delighted you're wearing that. And I, it just hadn't occurred to me that anyone would notice it. I, I wear it for myself because I am proud to support uh, people from LGBT backgrounds. But it, people really clocked it. They really clocked it. And it was a bit of a wake up call for me and thinking, actually, what you do and say and the way you behave on issues around equality and diversity do absolutely matter. And I think that is the case for chief executives. But I think it's the case for anybody uh, in an organisation. Thanks, Dara. Thank you. I mean, I hope that answers your question and uh, thank you for being with us today. I'm going to move the discussion on only for time purposes. Um, the next question is from Councillor Dora dixon Bile. Are you with us, Councillor? Yes. Hi, Dara. Um, hi to everybody. Um, I just wanted to ask, head and heart, uh, to the panel, how important are the issues of equality, diversity, inclusivity, etc., within your organisation from a political uh, perspective? And also, what are you doing to support uh, elected members like myself um, um, 
and to help them to understand uh, the issues of equality and diversity. Thanks, Councillor. Rachel. Thank you for that question. So, um, first of all, I think um, equality and diversity from a political perspective is, is absolutely recognised in our organisation. I think one of the issues is how we work alongside political leaders, and I'll be interested in your own view on this, to really bring it to life. So a really good example for me has been the pandemic, where we know that there's been a disproportionate impact on groups in our community. And what was very powerful is when we sat alongside a number of our politicians and said, actually, let's really think about who is best to advise and support us on additional interventions. And of course, the answer was those members who are elected by communities who are of colour, who can really talk about why things are happening to understand very deeply and very clearly what interventions will and won't work and who can make those networks real. So we then had um, a very regular meeting of our uh, members to talk very specifically about issues connected with race, the pandemic and then eventually uh, the vaccination programme. And that was really powerful because it was a very concrete something that we could talk to members about and they were absolutely committed to wanting to ensure that all of their residents were equipped to fight the pandemic in the way that everybody else was. But I think making it very real, being able to describe somebody's experience, so being able to describe, for instance, why a looked after child who might be, uh, might have a disability, might be a uh, black a child might have an issue around extreme poverty and deprivation, talking about what that young person or that family need to really help them maximise their own outcomes. So, so for me, there's something about making it very, very real and taking it back to individuals and communities to really drive change and drive action, because making that connection is I think often easier for people if they can understand some of the underlying causation, where we're trying to get to, and then think about what we do to influence change in a very positive way for people. Thanks, Rachel. Tom, what would you what would you say to uh, Councillor's question? Thanks, and yeah, thanks, Dora. I think it's I mean really important one. It, I mean in in Salford, it's it's almost I would say we. Um, we are a very politically led organisation. Um, if you if you know our politics, we're we're known for being um, very clearly politically led, not a political statement. But um, I think the direction of travel there is um, fundamentally and has been for a very very long period of time. I'm going back to the 1960s before reorganisation and so on here. Um, very welcoming of migration and very fundamentally and values led um, anti discriminatory for our on, on a whole host of different levels. And I see that kind of inheritance through different generations of politicians represented on the council now, which I think is positive. You know, we have all of the right things in place that you would expect that's writ large through our organizational priorities, through our various engagement for uh, through specific roles within the cabinet through reverse mentoring at a political level as well as in the um, office for in, in ways that um, Stuart was talking about earlier. Hi Stuart, we'll see you again now which is good. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's really important and I think Rachel's comments about relying on um, elected members to be that kind of positive and very proactive and often very you know, I've found over many years working in um, areas like Oldham, in Blackburn, in Wakefield, bringing that very, very unvarnished voice of the community and that unvarnished community experience to the table, I think is really important. The other side of it, I think, is focusing on the um, uh, the economics of how this is led politically. I mentioned this earlier. So in Salford, we've done things like a Poverty Truth Commission, a very, very open dialogue about the experience of poverty in an ultra diverse inner city um, community and re-geared our whole economic and financial strategy around addressing those things. 
we're running a similar process now on the back of the whole traumatic experience nationally of the um, Sarah Everard aftermath, um, a, a women and girls commission in Salford led by Sharmina August, who I've introduced to DAR for other reasons, um, who's leading that work for us here in um, the city now. And lots of programmes around our economic inclusion that I think are important to bringing, you know, that that different perspective on diversity is as much about people's lived economic experience and poverty, quite honestly, as it is about um, representation. I think the final thing I would say is um, I think it's very important at that political managerial interface that, you know, going right back to the allyship um, point at the start of the conversation, Doa, that people see um, empathy and understanding um, from senior leaders, particularly from the chief exec. And I found it quite difficult um, being completely honest with um, everyone on this call to um, almost kind of uh, lay my personal story um, bear in that respect um, to people. I haven't kind of worn that on my sleeve throughout my career, but I felt it was more important the more senior I got that people saw that actually I suspect I'm right in saying that a number of you on the call have made certain assumptions about me um, <clears throat> already before I started talking today. And since I started talking, we've spoken about white privilege. Um, I think people often don't assume that um, a middle class 45 year old white bloke can have experienced quite serious victimization and discrimination in his life. And I've made a virtue of trying to explain that to people in terms of my lived experience. My uh, my wife, who I met when I was a, a teenager, is uh, Indian. She's a um, she's an Indian Hindu uh, lady and we have mixed race children and when we first met we we both suffered but particularly me um, what I can only describe in the shorthand as victimization discrimination in quite a serious way um, I lived with police protection for that for a number of years when we first came together and that experience I think as well as the fact that I was, you know, never in my heart in any way a discriminatory individual, just brought that home to me in a way that I've, um, you know, never really been able to get over, quite honestly. And I think telling that story, explaining that story, explaining why, you know, the future of my children, their attitude and outlook as a result of that experience in our family, um, the fact that my wife has been my best confidant, my best ally, my best example I can give of um, lived experience that's been positive in that respect um, has just been, you know, life changing in all of the right ways. And I think what I've found in Salford and in some of the other authorities that I've worked in as well, um, elected members of, you know, they appreciate seeing the human side of this. And I think it's important to understand that people of all colours, all backgrounds, um, you know, experience discrimination, victimization in ways that often surprise people. And I think in leadership roles, it's important to, you know, quite frankly, wear that on your sleeve and explain to people that this is more than just about the right terms, the right reports, the right strategies, the right groups, all the apparatus I have in place in the city council here. Um, but for me, it's about my kids, it's about my wife, it's about my family and my experience. And I think that. Um, I think for me, looking at leaders I admire, that always goes a long way for me, and I hope my contribution to that narrative does as well, quite honestly. Tom, thank you for sharing, uh, sharing something which is so personal. Um, thank you for sharing it with the with the group. Um, Councillor Dora, I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm going to move the conversation. Yeah. Sorry, did you have something to say? I was just going to say, um, uh, the lady, somebody in the chat room, I think Shabana Ali, who said that um, don't forget the members, include them in the uh, in the diversity conversation. We are at the end of the day ordinary people, but we have our experiences as we, we've had pan the panel described theirs. We've got ours as well, and I just think it's a shame that it's taken a pandemic to actually see. Um, uh, um, members of uh, Black and Asian uh, background being actually encouraged and actually used and brought out to the front to go and talk to that particular community. We have views on homelessness, looked after children and everything. You know, so it'd be really, I mean, I've been a counsellor for 24 years now and 
this is the first time that we've actually this year had a specific uh, training course on uh, anti-racism and that was quite interesting but that's another time that conversation but I think my message is just just please include us in, in helping to solve this problem. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just conscious that there's a lot of comments uh, on the chat. Uh, Nadra, can you give us an update on what's being said, what people are feeling? Um, how long have I got, Nadra? Because, oh my God, yeah. the, the room is just buzzing. The chat is buzzing. What's been said by our panellists is just hugely, hugely inspirational. Let me just start with some of the commentary that we've had from our panellists, if I may, um, uh, Nadra, very quickly. So it's very much around bringing people together for mutual uh, discussion, strength in numbers, empowerment and drive, hope, responsibility for all of us. This is not about individual action, but individual action is clearly contributing. Make the change we need to see. Um, align allyship with anti-racism. There is clearly a recognition of white privilege Positive action. Action has been mentioned so many times. It's great to do the talking, but what are we collectively doing and delivering in terms of action? We were talking about reverse mentoring um, and positive action approach. Important to ensure that staff feel supported. A lot around openness and encouraging open and transparent dialogue and bringing the conversation forward that, that can be seen to be quite taboo and tricky. Equality and inclusivity, working together to work through the requirements. Then there was a lot of conversation about the report itself, how it was inflammatory, the, the, the language, the terminology, and how it was positioned. There was some discussion around the label of BAME, and Joe, you articulated that really well. Shielding representation and challenge, we're doing that through using that acronym. Um, there was also a hard push for reverse mentoring and education. I've mentioned that already. We're not a model country. That was something Joe brought to the, the table as well. And then we had um, some some focus from from Tom around economic inclusion and the importance of that. Um, sharing optimism. We had a big discussion around social media and its inappropriateness and what will the big tech giants call it out and do something around that. Um, promoting and encouraging people who look like us. So what are we going to do to ensure that we don't all look the same? Um, elected members and politicians and the key role that they play and, and really kind of articulated by Dora just now as to the importance of bringing them into the discussion and the dialogue and helping, asking them to help facilitate some of the, the conversations and, and the tricky subjects. And then of course, um, very much around safe spaces, um, really kind of promoting um, some of the work that, that the C, uh, CEOs are doing in terms of bringing forward empathy as figureheads, championing um, some of these issues on behalf of their organisations, their communities and the people that they serve and seeing the human side. So, um, there, there were also a couple of points. Um, one of the questions was already picked up about making sure that the um, inclusion is actively on the agenda, not just a bolt on. And I think once again, uh, Tom picked that up. But there is a question here around the Rooney rule. How many organisations, how many, um, how many uh, councils or organisations are openly adopting that? I don't know if people want to come forward on that question itself. Are you addressing that to the panel? I am. Or Dara, you can ask the panel either way. But yes, it would be uh, helpful to understand if there is, is any um, feedback on that point specifically. Stuart, would you like to say something? You're on mute, Stuart. Do we have him? We might have lost him. Just when he was about to say something. Yeah. We've also had a recommendation, if I just may for a second, Dara, anti-racist ally, an introduction to um, action and activism by Sophie Williams. So, so one of our colleagues has posted that in the chat as well. 
OK, it's thank you so much for such a comprehensive uh, update. Um, I, I am I, I did mention at the start, you know, we, we don't just want to talk at you. Um, if there's people in the in, in, in the uh, in the audience that want to say something, it's a good time. Put your virtual hands up. I can bring you into the conversation now. Andrew, you're first. Andrew Rostam, do you want to introduce yourself to the group and say what would you like to say? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Dala. So uh, my name's Andrew Rostam. I'm head of programs and transformation at the London Borough of Haringey. Nice so you. I've got a quick question for the panel. Uh, many of you as leaders will probably acknowledge that there are issues around um, diversity and inclusion, particularly at the senior leadership level. For me, talent and potential is everywhere, but the opportunities, unfortunately, just simply aren't. How important is it to you that your senior teams are more reflective and more representative in terms of diversity for the communities that you support? And why specifically is it important for you to have a diverse team? Thank you. Tom. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the straight answer, Andrew, is it's, it's very important and it's important that we um, call out action that isn't taken to improve that. I think my only caveat would be um, it is diversity of representation, but it's also diversity of experience that I think counts. I don't just mean professional experience, but I mean lived experience. And I think, you know, I would just come back to the point that, um, you know, often I, I do a lot of work behind the scenes that is unnoticed, is invisible in policy and interventions and so on, but is really just about understanding what sits behind the mask in uh, people, in individuals, in groups and teams. I think that's very important in understanding politicians' lived experience in the same way as it is your senior team. And whilst my senior team that I've largely inherited, I have to say, I'm blessed really, I think, with it being quite a diverse group, um, predominantly female, you know, there is a lot more to that diversity of experience that sits around the table than just the gender balance or the ethnicity balance. And I think it's very important in having this conversation that we keep talking about that underlying diversity of experience, professional, lived, whatever you want to call it, as well as the um, obvious kind of protected characteristic categories. Thanks, Tom. Rachel, what would you say to Andrew? I'd say I agree 100 percent with Tom. And I think we've got to be very careful that we don't make inaccurate and unhelpful assumptions about people. So I, I've had a couple, uh, only a couple of expressions from members of my staff about my team being uh, an all white team, for example. Now, my very strong view on that is you, you don't actually know what people's background is, really. You don't know uh, what their experience has been. And you need to be very careful that you don't make judgments about people. And what I'm absolutely interested in is diversity of experience and actually diversity of thought. We don't all want to think the same way. We don't all want to approach our, our, our issues in the same way. We want to encourage diversity of thought. We want to make sure that we have diverse experiences. And, our, and for me, when you get alongside people, whether they're your team, they're your colleagues in other organisations, whether you're elected members, when you're really alongside people and you understand their stories, I can't think of anybody whose story I now know in the place I work that doesn't have within it an element of diversity. I can't think of a single person. Uh, so, you know, for, how do you harness that? How do you harness that sense of you've got this story and this experience? You might not want to share it with everybody openly, and that's absolutely fine. But let's just draw on that experience to really put our shoulders to the wheel collectively around inclusion. Thanks, Rachel. Stuart, have you been able to rejoin us? I hope so. Can you see and hear me? We can. Uh, yes, we can. Right. Brilliant. I am so sorry. I don't know what happened. Um, I know I spent about five minutes talking to myself uh, earlier. Um, <laughs> apologies for that. It took me a long time to realise everything was frozen. Um, so just on the point of the Rooney Rule, I've just put it in the chat. We in, in Westminster have adopted the Rooney Rule. Um, we've had it for about two and a half years. We call it positive action. Uh, it has transformed appointments, I have to say. Um, and for me, you know, that does speak volumes about what went before and lack of um, equal opportunity. However, the positive side of it is we we are seeing a change 
in our middle and senior leadership roles as a result. Um, it was a real battle for me to introduce it in our organization. Uh, it, it's something that I'd kept a very close eye on for a long time. And then when I became chief executive, wanted to introduce it. Um, I had a series of HR lawyers and experts telling me it was illegal and unlawful and we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that. Um, and then I was shown our first, uh, we, we decided we were going to uh, run and publish an ethnicity pay gap. Uh, and I was shown the the our ethnicity pay gap in our organization. And um, again, there's somebody on the call who was in the room with me when I saw it. And you know, I, I, I'll be honest, I turned the air blue. And at that point, I said, right, I'm not taking no for an answer again. We are doing this. You, all of you lawyers, et cetera, you go away and tell me how. Not no anymore. Um, and we did introduce it as a result. Um, it does have pitfalls. You know, we... Um, we we weren't keeping close enough eye on what the data was telling us, and and um, it looked like we were we were making significant progress in terms of appointments. But what we saw initially was all those appointments were at the the sort of lower levels of the organisation. So we've now we're now using the data. We're being more forensic with it, and we're making sure that it it applies across all levels of the organisation in terms of those appointments. Brilliant, thanks, Joe. Sorry, famous last words, I'm on mute. Um, yeah, I was just going to add, I think what I've seen through my clients is we've we've been introducing for many years positive action campaigns at the recruitment, uh, at the first stage of the recruitment process or uh, ethnic minority development programmes, another act of positive action where there's a ceiling. Um, it's solved one problem in that it's widening the opportunity for applications, but it's not solving the problem. And the problem is that uh, ethnic minority individuals are not progressing up the whole recruitment cycle. When you analyse the end to end, there is a dilution of diversity uh, the closer we go to hire. So there is a couple of re there's many reasons why that is. And I'm sure many of you will, will, will think about the obvious ones. But many of the organisations that know they need to do positive action are still not addressing the fact that they have a cultural fit of what a leader should look like in their organisation. So when it gets to any kind of intervention where there's any level of objectivity in the hiring process, whilst they may be following that, they're still focused on a mindset of culture fit rather than culture add. So we talk about how can a candidate be additive to the culture rather than fit, because it immediately narrows that mentality. And the same I would say for positive action development programmes, women development programmes, ethnic minority programmes, Yes, they elevate people for a period of time. The feedback can gener generally be good, but there is no real career trajectory. Many of the organisations we work with don't see that there is a change in profile. So those programmes are really important and some are great, but they need to be tied to what happens over the next year or 18 months of that person's career. And don't just stop there. Keep that regular support going by way of allyship after that development programme. Thank great. you. Thank you. Right, I'm going to move things on. Um, forgive me if you have your hand up uh, just for now. Um, only for time purposes, I'm aware we've only got half an hour left. Um, the next question comes from uh, Sangeeta Lehi. Sangeeta, are you here? Hi, um, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, hi. My question, it's a really simple one. It's um, Sangeeta, just... do you introduce yourself and let everyone know who you are? So sorry, yeah, end of a long day. Sangeeta Lehi, Director of Public Health at Civic Council. Um, great to be here. So my question, a really simple one. Can you give a practical example of how you've held individuals to account on equalities? Um, I, I didn't put in my original question and I hope it's OK just to add this in the workplace because I think that's where the difficulties can arise. Thanks. OK, um, Daljeet. Yeah, thanks for that. I, th I think um, each of us can probably think of examples where we've um, had difficulties in the workplace or seen things. Um, I certainly, um, over the last many years, um, look back and think there's been times when I've seen and heard things where I thought, why didn't I say something about that? Why didn't I challenge that at the time? Um, it's probably much easier now because um, I don't know whether it's just I'm old and and I'm happy and, and I'll just say what I think these days. So for me, there's, there's probably been, you know, a number of occasions, you know, a, a good example for me. And I'm sorry, I'll just use some personal things if that's OK, because I think I remember being 18 straight on to, as a student nurse, straight into a big teaching hospital 
Um, second set of work is um, night shift for 10 weeks. And I go in and um, it, at break time, I'm told by this um, gentleman who's getting on in his years, um, who's actually a member of staff, um, if you want to pray at the Mecca, get yourself out of this room. And I thought to myself, I, I don't actually even know what he's talking about because I'm a Geordie Sikh and not a very good one because even though my dad used to try and make me go to the God door, I never went. So um, it, it was, and but I didn't challenge him. I just like looked at him and went, oh, yeah, 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 and left the room. Now that stuck with me for many years because I just thought he openly thought it was okay to do that. Roll on 15 years later, and um, this one's a bit unbelievable, actually. I'm in a, I'm in a training session, and I'm told, um, uh, would you, uh, right, everybody stand in a line by their birthday, and it was to try and smooth the line, so everyone stands in their birthday, and somebody quite senior comes up to me and whispers in my ear, this would be quite amusing if we did it by colour of our skin which is, I, you're the only uh, brown person here. Um, and, and even then, all I did was, oh, um, right, right, and went to see my boss the next day and said, that's really unacceptable. What are you going to do about it? Instead of saying, what am I going to do about it? And then roll on just recently in the last few years. And it gets to the point where now, um, you know, around a particular Black Lives Matter issue and the relationship with all or every life matters, I, I just did a major call out and said, look, that's totally unacceptable, not having a formal complaint. So for me, it's about, you know, and I'm sure there's lots of people on this call who can think of things that might have happened to their parents. I saw Ranveer Singh on GMB, I think it was this morning or yesterday morning, where she was recalling being racially abused on the way to school and really worrying about that and still actually worrying about it in terms of her son. So for me, it's about standing up for what's right and calling out. I think sometimes people can be bullies in um, so many ways, can't they? And it's, it's you know, not just about race, it's about all sorts of um, equalities issues and general living issues. And I think for me, the um, practical examples of how we do that is the number one thing for me is calling out the behaviour, making sure that we support people. You know, I've, I've had over the last couple of years, particularly because of COVID, quite a number of staff um, I, I don't actually have that many minority staff, but interestingly, a number of them um, not being treated as well as they could in some of our organisations, but allied organisations, partnership organisations. And for me, um, you know, I had no thought about calling that out. Um, I think the positive thing for me was people came forward and said to me and said, can I have a te quick teams call or can I just ring you up and I'm like yes absolutely and telling me that you know they hadn't been afforded a, a, a risk assessment um, a, an ethnicity risk assessment that we'd done as a special um, arrangement for our staff from minor minority communities and um, you know that's very easy to put right by doing that but there's some very simple things we can do we can call it out I just also wanted to come back to the issue of the diversity of teams. I, I do still look around and I and, and then I'll be honest, I'm really torn because part of things for me is it's about the best person for a job and who puts themselves forward and how we do that. So sometimes it's very difficult that if you're recruiting to senior levels of of um organizations and there isn't a diverse range of people who you know who it might just be something about the football in Newcastle that people don't want to come north and and, uh, and be with us but we really struggle I mean joking aside we've got a responsibility haven't we to encourage everyone but do you know one of the things I'm really encouraged about is some of the really forthright people on this call and some of the views that are coming through in the comments. And, you know, I know I said it before about things have changed, but I do, 
I really believe that. And I, I totally believe that some of the younger people on this call are going to make it through and really be driving forward. Um, and yeah, there might just be a couple or four or eight um, chief executives currently, but I'm pretty sure if we do the right thing, we'll make sure that the the all levels of the organisation, because it's not just about leadership positions, about all levels are well represented, represented in terms of the diversity of our communities and also our organisations. So sorry, I strayed into the other question as well, there's Dawa. Thank you, Dolji. Thank you for sharing that. And just just in uh, in response to what you said about uh, recruitment, I think the basic premise always has to be the best person for the job. Um, and if that pipeline of talent is not there, I guess the question we need to ask is, what are we doing to improve that pipeline of talent? You know, because when you look at local authorities, when you look at councils, it doesn't matter whether they're in a diverse com serving a diverse community or not. You only have to take a look at this room and see and see how rich that talent is. So it's reaching a particular level, but then it's not going any further. Uh, call it a glass ceiling. In some cases, call it a concrete ceiling. Um, and also in terms of um, steps being made in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, if you take London, for example, which has a 67% non-white population and 32 boroughs that serve that, there are only four non-white CEOs of those councils. And 12 years ago, there were two. What we don't want is to wait another 12 years because before there's another two. And I just want to bring in um, one of those uh, chief executives, actually. Kim Smith, are you are you are you here? You kind of lined that up. Dara. I kind of did. I kind of did. Didn't you? <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. I'm Kim Smith. I'm the chief executive at Hammersmith and Fulham. And just um, uh, to the panel, I just, uh, you know, spent an hour of my time, the chat, the, the questions, the answers. The, the authenticity behind what you're saying, you bring yourself to this conversation. I struggle with that because I'm tired and I'm fatigued and I am tired of talking about my story. So thank you for sharing all of yours because it's really hard answering these questions because we're on a journey too. So I just wanted to say two things quickly. I agree with what Joe's talking about, about recruiting for attitude rather than teach uh, recruiting for skills. We can teach skills. I can learn how to do fly fishing. I can learn how to abseil. I can learn how to paint. I can learn how to do all of those things, but you cannot teach me attitude. And if we start to recruit, we just did a local um, uh, graduate um, scheme, London Living Wage, local people. What were the questions that we were asking them? Finish this sentence. I love Hammersmith and Fulham because. Try and find out the people who know the back route as well as the front route, who know what's precious about Shepherd's Bush, who know about the um, disparity between the wealthy South and the poorer North. We need to change that. So I really welcome what you said, um, Joe. But the other thing I was going to say is a um, little bit a little bit more negative. We're all violently agreeing with each other. We're violently agreeing that there's a problem and everybody's got something to say about it. And last week I was... Um, shortlisting on a, a panel for a national um, equalities, diversity and inclusion uh, public sector um, uh, um, competition award. And uh, there's a real stark disparity between the ones that are really good and the ones that aren't. And what I can't get over is the audacity of some boroughs and some regions to put in bids for greatness when actually what they're doing, you know, uh, is, is, is uh, I just wouldn't be proud if that was happening in my borough. So what I think I need to better understand of myself and of other chief execs and other people in leadership positions, and we all kind of got a leadership de de um, position depending on the audience, because earlier on when Sarah um, did her poem, she, you know, she was leading, she had the soft power. Um, don't care who's got hard power and don't care who's got qualifications. What I would like to understand or leave or, or take from this meeting is. Somebody said to me it was a uh, Dr. Ben um, Lindsay uh, uh, power the fight in Lewisham. He said, I don't need your funding because we've got. Community buy in, tell me or ask me or support me to do what is scalable and what is sustainable. And that 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 that's what I challenge myself on. So we got lots of ideas and we're doing lots of stuff in pockets in London. Some of us, including Stuart and I and others, Althea, Ian and uh, Ade and others are really trying to do something across the piece. 
87,000 people work across London's um, local authorities, 87,000. Guess what we found out when we did the first ever, the first ever ethnicity and um, pay um, survey. So I wouldn't mind hearing what can we do that's scalable or sustainable? Because I, 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 I think small steps and nail it and make sure that it sticks, make sure it becomes habitual, make sure it becomes cultural, make sure that it, it stays, make sure that you nudge the behaviour rather than makes the rules. What gets measured gets done. So for me, small steps that are sustainable that we can come back and we can measure are the things that matter. But I'd really be interested in, um, you know, who else is a bit fatigued and who else has been. Sometimes I say in local government that I've got 32 years experience. Sometimes I say it's one year's experience repeated 32 times. Just help me um, a little bit on anything we could do that tells people who are listening something that takes it to the next level. And I challenge myself on that as well as colleagues. Thanks. Thanks, Dawa. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, always compelling. Um, Rachel. Kim, lovely to see you. I, I think it'd be really interesting, wouldn't it, to think about whether or not there was an appetite for us to collectively across the local government sector put a bid into government connected with the levelling up agenda. So I, I just wonder if it is worth a number of us just having a conversation on the art of the possible. What is it that is happening across places that's fantastic, that we could scale, that we want government to back us on, and we could really start to feel as if we're moving the dial? Just wonder if it's worth that conversation. Wow. And if that conversation is a result of just a few of us coming together at this, you know, in a group like this, that would just be great. Um, Going to move on to the next question, if that's OK. Joanna Brown, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks to our and um, hi, I'm, I'm Jay Brown. I'm the director of people and inclusion at Camden Council. Um, I've really loved the conversation so far, really moving, really rich. Um, I've really got a lot from it um, and we started to touch on I think the answer to, to my question which is how ready is your organisation for uncomfortable conversations and I think many of you have started to talk about already being in those uncomfortable conversations which I think is you know really refreshing and then the follow-on part is what can leaders do to create safe spaces for those conversations to be able to happen freely? Okay Good question. Um, if I could go from one Joe to Joe Heath, please. Okay. Hi, Joe. Um, I'm going to be really cheeky and just throw a very quick answer into a previous question because I'm really eager to just cover off that on accountability and then I'll answer yours, Joe. Just want to give a really quick example of an organisation and it's a more positive example because I appreciate I've been a little negative on this call. So I've been coaching um, some, some white leaders for some time and this particular organisation that these leaders come from, um, they've also asked me to do some training for their, for their teams. And on this training was a, a young Asian woman who worked in one of their procurement teams in quite a junior position. And she had the training and she left there. And what I didn't know, because she didn't raise it on the session, was that she'd been experiencing racism and microaggressions from a supplier, a really large supplier to that organisation. And this particular supplier had been behaving quite awful to her for over 10 years. And she'd never felt safe to challenge it. So she did. She raised it with the senior leaders and as a result of that, and hopefully a little bit of my prompting with the coaching, the senior leaders took severe accountability and actually removed that supplier from their patch completely. That contract was worth uh, £7 million a year and it was for 10 years. And so for me, that was a real great example, example through a supplier of them taking a real stand and supporting just that one individual uh, and setting a real tone. So um, I, I just thought I'd quickly throw that in. Um, getting back to whether um, whether organisations are ready. Well, I obviously speak from an external perspective rather than from a Green Park perspective. Are our clients ready to have the uncomfortable conversations? And I don't even like using those words because it shouldn't be uncomfortable. But I think the reality is no. 
And I say that with some level of authority. Um, no, because through some of our network groups, we survey people and we ask the question, do you think your leaders are having those conversations and are they comfortable? And over 90% of every group say no. And the second reason why I say that is we've conducted over 100 inclusion assessments or, or audits and we get to interview uh, many people of colour at all grades through the organisation. And one of the biggest uh, things that they share with us is that they do not feel their leaders have a conversation at all about race. And this was surfaced or resurfaced because of BLM and the disappointment they felt about leaders not making a response. Um, and lots of other reasons why they don't see it. They see it through performance development decisions. So they see that leaders have a much easier time giving critical development conversations to their white colleagues like them than perhaps the black and Asian colleagues for whatever reason. And leaders will say it's because of fear and because of lack of developmental steer that has a systemic effect on their promotion, their performance rate in their progression. So I would summarise with saying no, but there are some positives. Um, and some of the leaders that we've worked with um, are really, you know, they have a lot of humility and honesty. They say we don't have the same frame of reference. We can't understand racial inequality. We haven't experienced that. And I think that vulnerability and honesty is the key. And then the solution around that, around how we can kind of move to those safe space conversations is about the environment. You know, nobody wants to talk about this on either side if the conversation isn't safe without judgment. People are not empowered to speak up and leaders won't get themselves in an environment where they'll put themselves at risk. So I think we have to encourage that in environments, uh, support leaders to make mistakes and be OK with that, to give them greater racial fluency, increase their cultural intelligence and competence. So I know I probably took a lot of airtime there, but I was quite passionate about that particular question. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Darrell. You're welcome. Uh, Stuart, uncomfortable conversations and what leaders can do to create safe spaces. Thanks, Darrell. <clears throat> um, so when I um, first came into this role uh, about three and a half years ago now, um, and made it very clear to our organisation that diversity and inclusion was going to be something that I pursued relentlessly um, uh, in the organisation. I was often um, accused, if I can use that word, by um, members of staff of forcing the difficult or uncomfortable conversations in our organisation. Um, they were always uh, tended to be white members of staff that, um, that uh, came and, and talked to me about that. Um, and there was a sort of assumption that the conversation was particularly difficult for white men in our organization. But actually, when um, we have given, uh, we've had uh, large scale leadership meetings and, you know, one of the one of the, the things that's really stuck in my mind was black women in our organization said, you know, if you white men think that this is a difficult conversation, I wake up in the morning and I wonder if that job that I didn't get was because I've been discriminated against. And then when I do get the job, I wonder if I've got the job because I'm a, a tick box or, you know, I'm part of Stuart's agenda here where, you know, it looks like we're doing something, you know. And so the message was, if we think as white men, the conversation is difficult, it's a hundred times more difficult for, you know, in, in this case, black women. And she was absolutely right. Um, so, you know, it is something that we have constantly got to remind ourselves these these are difficult conversations there are they are uncomfortable conversations i i am glad to say that i don't get that uh, much anymore i don't have people accusing me of forcing the difficult conversations because we do talk about race a lot it's important i talk about it all the time um it is i i believe that you know as i've said before this is part of every conversation every decision um i do want to say when um george floyd's murder happened um, we, I, for me, I saw a change in our organization. I saw an organization come together and Serena Simon, I don't know if Serena's still with us, coined a phrase in our organization, which was because we had a lot of people saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know how, what to say and who to talk to. And, and the phrase was turn up imperfectly rather than not turning up at all. Uh, and, and I have to say that by and large, our organization embraced that. Uh, we have staff networks in our organization. Those networks didn't exist um, previously. 
and they've then that they, they don't exist because anybody has said that they have to they have now seen an organization that isn't just listening when it comes to this but an organization that is prepared to take action and as a result of that we have networks that not only hold us to account but they're also driving us they're also coming up with new ideas uh, helping us to change direction helping our, our culture to flex and change as it, as it always will will need to and in in those areas we now have some of those safe spaces um, and they have been created by the organization, not um, by by me or, you know, somebody saying we will or you have to. Um, and I think that's that's uh, really, really important. I think picking up on something that that Tom said earlier, which I, I believe is is fundamental to this, and that is the the piece about giving of yourself and and being authentic. And I, you know, I'm I'm an introvert, and and I I do struggle with this sometimes. But I I also um, know that I have to I have to tell people how I'm feeling, how this is impacting on me, what I am seeing happening uh, to to other people in our organisation, and the experiences that I've had as well. So that authenticity um, in leadership is i i believe as, as um thomas said absolutely critical and being prepared to share our stories thank you Stuart. tom what would you say to joe um well i i think it's hard to disagree with a lot of Stuart's comments really on on this i think um i think you only set and create that culture of safety around these conversations and it is often about safety because it is difficult for us all all the way up to people who would appear to be uber confident in positions of authority and privilege find it quite difficult often talking about these things and i think the acknowledgement of that fact is important and goes a long way that that i think goes back to um actually something rachel commented on right at the start of the uh the the, the meeting tonight which is what we pay attention to what we spend our time doing um and what we talk about as leaders in organizations it, it it inevitably we can't avoid it it commands others attention and i think you have to deploy that as a sort of almost soft power influence very very carefully very diligently and very deliberately it was something that a, a mentor of mine said to me many many years ago um you know watch what a chief executive does and it often you know by very small steps it changes and and, and um, evolves the culture of the organization I think in Salford, we are ready for those uncomfortable conversations. And it isn't just about me and, you know, telling my story. It's about that, I think, precedent of having almost a kind of truth commission of confronting difficult facts about ethnicity, about poverty, about lived experience, about the causes and consequences of deprivation in communities and tackling that head on in a, you know, very politically determined way. I think what comes on top of that is um, people being prepared to share their own lived experience and really just to create safe spaces for what can be very challenging conversations. I mean, I, you know, I don't run all of our representative groups myself by any means, as others have said, it wouldn't be right or appropriate to, but just by me turning up and having a conversation with our um, LGBT group, um, in my first week at the council, which I, I prioritized. Um, it went from having a handful of people involved to having 30 plus people involved within the last six months. I mean, that's not a colossal figure, but it outed a lot of conversations. We're making changes to have, you know, transgender friendly restrooms as a consequence that was never even spoken about in Salford previously. And I think those things are small steps that can really um, make a difference but I do you know I do believe in uh, the power of a personal story I always have you know we've seen titans giving us examples of that over the years in community relations work all the way back to Martin Luther King and beforehand and I wouldn't by any means draw personal comparisons there but I think Stuart is right in saying you know um, <laughs> he and I will get on because I'm an introvert as well I find this stuff difficult to talk about but I think as leaders we have a responsibility to do that and to help our organizations into a comfortable space to join us in that journey really I think you should describe yourself as an inspiring Tom not an introvert um Joanna um I know I mean does that answer your question I know I know your organization is 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 very progressive having recruited at least four diverse directors in the last 12 to 18 months what's worked for you 
Yeah, I'd say it's sort of a combination of what others have said on the call. So very much um, creating the enabling environment and you know not trying to over control. So um, certainly our safe spaces at, at Camden are happening right across the organisation. They're self-organised and they're you know very well attended. We are able to get really good insights um, from those conversations as to you know what's working well but equally what perhaps we need to put a bit more focus and attention on um, and one of the sort of the themes which many of you have touched on today is yes it's all well and good having these conversations and I think we're really good at that now and you know even the difficult ones but actually you know we need to be absolutely committed to the action and maintaining that and continuing that focus as we move forward because I think we have been here before We've had sort of short periods of time where we focus on whether it's ethnicity or disability in our organisation and then we've moved on to something else and we've lost some of that focus. So I think you know, the, the challenge for us is to maintain the focus and to you know, keep those conversations going. We've just uh, finished or in the latter stages of finishing rolling out an anti-racism learning offer at Camden, which has been the entire workforce. Um, going through that and that really has included some reflection sessions so really leaning into some of that discomfort and what that's shown is that you know despite the fact that we think we're in a, a relatively good position you know we probably are compared to many other organizations we still do have a long way to go and we have a lot of employees in our organization who don't really understand structural racism who don't really understand what a microaggression is and how to challenge it appropriately if they see it um, so you know I think it is an ongoing process and something you need to constantly pay you know masses of attention to. Thank you Joanna it's wonderful to see you today thank you for joining us right um panel members 30 seconds each we are drawing to a close final words Joe Heath that you're on mute God, God, um, I've said enough, so I'm not going to say anything, but thank you. I, I've really appreciated. I was um, I was really fatigued uh, around recent events, but you've prompted and propped me up uh, and inspired me. So thank you. Particular thanks to Zara for, for the, the wonderful poem. Um, that was fantastic. But I really enjoyed listening to everyone's contribution. So just a thank you from me. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Rachel. Uh, never underestimate your own ability to make a difference. Uh, and, and never underestimate your own ability to progress. Thank you. Daljit. Yeah, I, I think I'd just like to say thanks to everyone. It's been a learning experience. I think we learn, don't we, all the time from everyone else as we go on and think about what we should do next. So that's been really helpful. I think the other thing is take positivity, because if someone like me from a working class background, both parents came here from India in the 60s, can become the chief executive of a, a large rural council right up in the north. Other people can do it too, and it's how we ena enable people to do that. Thank you, Lilji. Tom? Yeah, I, I just echo others' thanks. I think uh, credit to you, Dawar, as well for um, you know imagining this forum and making it happen. Uh, it's one of the ironies of lockdown, really, is I think the engagement has been <laughs> great in this, uh, and it's and it's grown. I think the conversations are invaluable, and I've I've uh, learned as much today as hopefully I've contributed. So yeah, grateful for the opportunity. Thanks. Well, grateful that you were here, and Stuart. I, I'm just going to repeat thanks. Um, I, I mean, Dara, thank you to you and, and the, the team around you and, and to the panellists and especially to everybody um, who's joined the call because I, I have been trying to keep an eye on the chat and I have found that uplifting. I spoke about hope earlier. I can tell you that I was in a bad place this morning. I'm in a much, much better place this afternoon. Thanks to everybody who's been on this call. And I am going to go back once this finishes and read that chat again. Um, thank you, everybody. And, and again, Zara, brilliant. Um, don't think you're still with us, but that was amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Right. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed uh, the discussion. Uh, please do remember to keep telling us what steps you would like us to take next. You know, this network can only have influence and power if you actively take part. Uh, I'd like to thank our panel members and uh, for all of you today for taking the time to be here. Stay safe. And until the next time we meet, goodbye. Thanks all. Thank you.